I'm Tom James, uh, Provost and Dean of the College at Teachers College, and I'm very, very happy to welcome you to this uh, SACS lecture, part of the SACS series this year, which is looking at the landscape of teacher education with all the uh, new conditions and circumstances facing us in the field. I'd like just to point out um, a little bit about the SACS lecture, where, where this came from um, at Teachers College. Um, th this is actually a lecture series that started in 1930. Uh, and what's interesting about that to me, when I think about um, our work this year with the Department of Curriculum and Teaching, is that that's roughly how old the Department of Curriculum and Teaching is. It came into being back in that same era, um, 85 years ago, uh, more or less, um, in the throes of the Depression, um, at a time when um, the profession was challenged, when society was um, uh, ruptured, by, by a great dislocation. And that was the time of um, Harold Rugg, who was in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching, uh, suggesting um, that we needed to form a new paradigm for a critical education that would look at democracy through a new lens, problem-based view of democracy. And it was in that era that the Sachs Lecture began. Um, it was also the era of George Counts in his book, Dare, the Soci Dare We Build a New Social Order and about teaching being part of a, um, a really an emanci emancipatory framework, again, within the context of the Depression. Um, so here we are again. You know, the, in a sense, the Sachs Lecture has come around. And here we are in 2015, you know, this venerable lecture series, um, asking those kinds of basic questions and asking them at a time when um, there are ruptures socially when democracy needs to be reconsidered. And I think it's very fitting, and I, I'd like to, I, we're gonna have an introduction of, of Thomas Phillip here, but I would particularly like to welcome him to this cold climate that we have produced coming from, from there, to come across the country and to land yesterday. You know what yesterday was like. So this is an intrepid uh, person we've got here for this. And Lynn Goodwin, Vice Dean uh, for teacher education and professor in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching is going to introduce him. Thank you. Anyway, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, our teacher education landscape speaker um, tonight, Thomas Marukara Philip, is an assistant professor. In fact, you know, lots of the information is already up here, so you know that he is an assistant professor at UCLA and that he also works in uh, teacher education um, at Center X. Um, and uh, teaches in the Division of Urban Schooling. Um, he received his PhD in Cognition and Development from uh, University of California, but at Berkeley, and his BS in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, also from Berkeley. So interestingly enough, um, Dr. Phillip started his career as a science teacher um, in high school in South, South LA. Um, when I look at the title of his speech, there are two words there that kind of characterize his work. You know, one is sort of tensions, and the other is intersections. And he talks about what he calls productive tensions that exist between theories of ideology and learning. And so he tries to bring sort of lenses that don't necessarily um, um, belong together, lenses that are not necessarily put together um, uniformly in order to examine you know, various issues, particularly questions of race and racism and people's perceptions or teachers' perceptions of them. So his research focuses on the relationship uh, between ideology, uh, particularly racial ideology, and the work of teachers. And he talks about his own work in terms of two strands. Um, so the first strand is basically how do teachers make sense of their work in a context where there are sort of competing um, discourses um, uh, sort of associated with power. Um, so how do you make sense of what you're doing and why you're doing it, particularly in more formal settings such as teacher education programs or professional staff development? And then the second related theme is how does the larger ideolo ideological context influence teaching and learning and how might teachers engage in reshaping the ideology. So one is, you know, the first draft is about how these ideologies impact you, and the second is how do you kind of work with, work within, work outside um, those ideologies and kind of push back against um, constraints. 
His work is um, not just unique, not just interesting, not just thoughtful, um, but also has received a great deal of attention. And so he's won a whole string of awards, and I'm just going to share with you um, a couple of them. So one is the um, American Educational Research Association Division G, which is Social Context of Education, Early Career Award. And he also received an award from Division C, Learning and Instruction, from also AERA, the Jan Hawkins Award for Early, Early Career Contributions to Humanistic Research and Scholarship in Learning Technologies. And I'll talk a little bit about technology in a, se in a second. And then the third is um, an award for um, his research in, um, in multicultural work um, from the National Association for Multicultural Education, or NAME, where he received the Carl A. Grant uh, Multicultural Research Award. And if you don't know Carl A. Grant, um, and you should. Um, but Carl is one of the sort of key scholars um, in multicultural education, and so it's a great honor that um, Dr. Phillip received this award. Um, there are articles um, that uh, are, are related to his talk tonight that um, are on the website, and I certainly would recommend them to you. But I thought I would share um, a few other pieces because um, he is a multi-dimensional scholar and has, of course, you know, several strands of inquiry um, that are related and connected. So one is um, sort of research around teachers of color and research around Asian Americans. So one example is moving beyond our progressive lenses, recognizing and building on the strengths of teachers of color in the Journal of Teacher Education. Another is Asian American as a political racial identity, implications for teacher education. And the last around um, you know, Asian Americanness is new starting points, uh, becoming Asian Pacific Islander educators in a multiracial and multicultural society. I, talked, I said that I was going to say something about technology, and part of his work, Intersex, is at the intersection of teaching and technology. So one example of his work um, is an article entitled The Importance of Still Teaching the I Generation, New Technologies and the Centrality of Pedagogy from the um, Harvard Educational Review. So we are very, very pleased um, to welcome you. Um, we are anxious to hear your talk. And so please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Thomas. Uh, so my, my plan for the day is, or for this evening, is to spend the first third of the talk thinking about why we should continue to address race in teacher education and explore the contemporary context or political context of addressing race in teacher education. Um, and the last two thirds or so, what I'd like to do is think about ways in which my research is a, is a piece of a larger project of advancing teacher edu education's engagement with issues of race, racism, and racial justice. So the big question is, why talk about race as teacher educators? And I want to emphasize this notion as teacher educators in 2015. And one of the most obvious responses that comes up when we talk about race within the context of teaching and learning is we think about the achievement gap. And this, the achievement gap is obviously an important concern. It's important in terms of thinking about how people access the culture of power. However, if we step back another le level, what we need to remember is that schools and programs of teacher education are sites where we learn to construct, consent to, navigate, challenge and re-envision our racialized society. And it's this element of addressing race, racism and racial justice that, that I think we oftentimes shy away from. And if, if, we take this, uh, if we take this idea that schools and teacher education programs is a place where we learn, relearn, unlearn, uh, how, how, what it means to be racialized in this society and to operate in a racialized society, the question then is, what sort of society do we now live in? And what I'd argue is it's important for us to step back and think about new and continuing forms of racialized violence that we're experiencing. So one is state violence. We've seen this in the cases of Eric Gardner, uh, Michael Brown, the dozens of, of young brown and black men that have, have suffered violence at the, at the hands of the state. We've seen this in how our nation handled uh, the arrival of tens of thousands of young, young people from Central America last summer. We see this in the recently disclosed CIA torture reports 
and the racialization of Muslims in, in the United States and the racialization of Arab Americans and South Asians. We see systemic violence and in, in terms of the disparate opportunities, the disparate uh, outcomes for, for racialized communities across this country. And we've seen it in terms of emotional and epistemological violence, um, such as the, the banning of ethnic studies in, in Arizona. So if this is the state of new and continuing forms of violence in our country, we need to step back and think how schools are sites for reproduction and transformation. So how are we learning to construct these forms of violence, consent to these form of forms of violence, and speak back to these forms of violence? Many of you have probably seen this, uh, seen this graph, and it's uh, the change in, in income inequality in the United States over the last four decades. And what we see is over the last four decades, there's been a tremendous increase in the, in the proportion of income for the top 5% and for the uh, top 20%, but also a drastic decline for those at the bottom uh, of, this, uh, of the spectrum. So then the question again is, what are we doing in schools and programs of teacher education that allow us to consent to this sort of inequality and to be content with this form of inequality and not challenge it? It's also essential for us to understand that the, um, the, the economic inequality that we're experiencing is also racialized, where the income gap between blacks and whites in this nation have actually increased over the last 40 years. So really challenging notions of a colorblind post-racial society and contending with the continued forms of inequality and racialized inequality that exists. Now, there's a tendency for us to think about both economic inequality and racialized violence as separate. Uh, for me, drawing, um, drawing a lot on the work of, of Antonio Gramsci, of, uh, of David Harvey, it's an important reminder that any form of system operates both by consent and coercion. And when inequality increases, the amount of coercion or violence that has to happen to sustain that system has to increase as well. So these forms of economic inequality that we're experiencing isn't separate in any way from racialized violence, but they are connected. And they're connected in new forms uh, that have changed over the last, last decades or last centuries, but it's important for us to contend with the connection between these. And again, how do we think about schools as these sites of reproduction or transformation where we either consent to these forms of inequality and violence or whether we learn to challenge and re-envision them? Now, there's, there's a huge challenge to talk, talking about issues of race in teacher education. And a lot of it is a mid-level level context of teacher education that we're now facing. We're seeing a tremendous amount of deregulation, whether it's uh, the Great Act, whether it's uh, the increase of programs such as Relay, uh, the TFA, where there is a push for deregulation. But we've also seen a tremendous amount of control uh, from, the, uh, from NCT, um, the National Council for Teacher Quality uh, for the new uh, proposed federal regulations on, on teacher education. And while deregulation and control might seem uh, disconnected, again, from a, uh, uh, from a perspective of neoliberalism and a critique of neoliberalism, these are very much coupled. And it's important for us to, uh, to see these connections. But we've also seen critiques of teacher education programs, university-based teacher education programs, for being overly theoretical and ineffectual. And those critiques have come from both outside, such as Arnie Duncan, but also from within. And, and uh, as many of you know, your former uh, president, Ar Ar Arthur was it? Levine. Levine, yes. Um, these critiques have been prevalent throughout the, throughout the academy. So it's important for us to contend with that. There's a, but it's also important for us to understand that past these mid-level contexts, all of this is happening within the larger uh, context of neoliberalism and market-oriented reform that goes beyond teacher education. So any challenge, any form of challenge to teacher education has to be understood within the larger, within the larger political context 
and how, how thoroughly it's affecting every aspect and every institution in, um, it globally and, and domestically. So at this point of intensifying inequality, the question is, what are our questions? What are our strategies, approaches, and visions moving forward? And when, when, I've, when I've had this co conversation with a lot of my colleagues, the major responses that I get is one, it's a question of survival. If we are to survive, we need to adapt. The other, the other um, response that I often hear is that we need to stay relevant. As university-based teacher education programs, if we're gonna stay relevant to the larger debate, we need to adapt in order to enter that conversation. And ultimately, there's a sense we're trying to do our best and we're moving within the system and we're trying to do our best. But I think what's important to acknowledge in this is that, uh, again, drawing a lot from Stuart Hall and, and Gramsci, there's a way in which this limits the logic of the debate. We can't transcend the logic of the debate. So what, while I argue it's important for us to acknowledge this and for us to respond to it strategically, it's also important for us to to really think about teachers and, and recognize and support teachers as conscious social agents in a stratified democracy. And, and this, this notion, I think, again, going back to what, um, what Provost James alluded to, and I didn't realize the, the history of the Sachs lecture, is that this notion of recognizing uh, teachers as conscious social agents emerged within this space, and, and, and I think that's what's so profound to be in this space now, and thinking about uh, scholars such as Harold Rudd, uh, William Kilpatrick, uh, George Count, who really understood the importance of recognizing teachers as social, conscious social agents. And it's no coincidence that we're coming back to this point at another point of great inequality. Right, that this, uh, this, this recognition of the role of teachers emerged within the context of the D Great Depression. And as we come out of the Great Recession that has, uh, has, has made this country even more inequitable, how do we return to these principles? And not return to them as if they were an absolute, but find meaning for what they, uh, what they tell us today in our contemporary political context. So why? When we say, when we think about teachers as conscious social agents, why are we emphasizing this notion? And, and, it, and for me, part of it is really understanding the notion of um, the responsibility and role of teachers as, as people who shape society. And again, very different than a sense of preparing, preparing young people for, for jobs, preparing teacher, uh, young people for the citizenry, but really shaping society. And that the work of teachers, as it happens at the intersection of student learning and experience, uh, communities, structure and ideology, and po policy. And it's where this work comes together that the classroom cultures they create can be microcosms of democracy. It can be places where we learn to practice democracy. It can, it can also be places where we learn to consent to a, authority. So it's, it's not to glamorize this, uh, this space, but it's to understand the potential of, of the space that teachers create. And with the hope that this can then transform society. <coughs> There's also a sense, whether it's, uh, wh whether it's uh, market-driven approaches or even, uh, I'd argue, uh, more progressive approaches to thinking about the work of teachers, oftentimes we prescribe what teachers should be doing as opposed to recognizing teachers as conscious social agents who understand their own political space and then engage with it. And particularly, given all the different uh, pressures that teachers are feeling, it is essential for teachers to understand their own political context, for them to then forge a solution in solidarity with communities, with students, and teachers. And, and we can look to the work of Pauline Lippmann or uh, Lois Weiner, to, to understand models in which teachers can work in solidarity with others as they understand their own political context, and these cannot be prescribed by us from beyond. 
And, and the last is really thinking about the, um, how teachers shape purpose and pedagogy in the classroom. And we've seen this, whether it's Doug Lamont's Teach Like a Champion, and again, I hesitate putting that on the same page uh, or, or the same slide as high level practices, which I think high level practices, again, offer a lot for teacher education. However, there is a way in which this, uh, any major reform effort is, is, is wrapped in the language of success for all. And if we, if we talk about success for all, as Danny Martin reminds us, racism can be hard to see. And in, in trying to succeed, uh, ensure success for all, we oftentimes forget or obscure or look over what it would mean uh, to attend to the specificities and particularities of different groups. I think what's also really important for us to, uh, go, going back to the, the tradition of, of social foundations, is to think, ask this hard question, success for what? What does it mean to succeed in a society that is inherently stratified, that requires stratified labor, that requires some people to uh, earn immense amounts of, uh, of, uh, of income? An average CEO work, earns what, 300, 400 times uh, what the average worker in, in the same company earns. What does it mean for, for us to prepare students to succeed in such an inequitable system? So it's, it's this space of thinking about how do we advance teacher education's engagement with issues of race, racism, and racial, race, racial justice. And I do want to hone in on this notion or this construct of recognizing and nurturing teachers as social agents who are committed to racial justice in a stratified democracy. And when we do this work, I, I do want to emphasize that it has to happen at multiple levels. It has to happen at a policy level. It has to happen programmatically, how we think about the preparation of teachers. And it has to happen pedagogically. My work is primarily at the pedagogical and programmatic level. And um, I, 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 I emphasize uh, my work tends to focus on, on this area, particularly because I, I believe it's a space to facilitate this important growth amongst teachers, but also recognize that in order for us to do this right, we need to do it at all three levels. And in the past, when, when we look at past examples, we do see the failings or, or, or the shortcomings of trying to focus on just one dimension. So for example, um, in terms of policy, mandated curricular inclusion has been problematic. For example, we can think about the inclusion of uh, examples from the civil rights movement. But what does it mean to teach about the civil rights still within the larger context of whiteness? If whiteness is not disrupted, when you do teach about the civil rights movement, it replicates or reproduces whiteness. So it's important for us to go beyond uh, simple policy mandates. We've seen it programmatically, and I think a lot of teacher programs of teacher education struggle with this, that our, our ways of preparing students, of preparing prospective teachers, aren't oftentimes aligned with what they experience in their classrooms. So there are limitations to programmatic implementations. And pedagogically, we've seen a number of wonderful examples, whether it's critical pedagogy, whether it's culturally relevant pedagogy, where they work in particular contexts, but there isn't the programmatic or the policy level mandates to support it. And so our work really has to happen at these three levels. Now, what, what I want to do, there's, there's a, a lot, 70 minutes of talking or 60 minutes of talking is a lot, but I, I don't, I want to give us a chance to just think about this, some of these ideas as they come up. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to pause for, for three moments in the, uh, during the talk, just to give us a chance to think about some of the core ideas and hopefully facilitate um, a larger dialogue at the end. So the, the, the first question that I'm going to put out for us just to reflect for two minutes is, what role do programs of teacher education currently play in supporting teachers' growth as social agents committed to racial equity and justice? What role should they play? And how might teacher educators be supported in taking on these roles and responsibilities? So we're going to have two minutes uh, to, to just briefly talk to someone sitting next to you of, of how you're thinking about it. And again, it's a way of getting us to to go beyond just uh, listening and to, to really thinking through, uh, through these dimensions. 
Uh, it's going to be really hard for me to bring the whole group back together, so there will be a gong that uh, <laughs> rings at the end of two minutes. So when you hear that, um, even if you're entrenched in the conversation, I really hope you'll, you'll step back and uh, come back together. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> teachers grow as, uh, as social agents. Uh, so as I, as I do this, though, I do want to recognize a long-standing commitment uh, to racial justice and, and equity in teacher education. But I do also want to very generally characterize the field as saying that a lot of what the field has talked about is both the destination and the barriers of what we need to do and some of the, the intense challenges that we face. To uh, to a lesser degree, we've seen some work on the possible routes that, that, uh, that help teachers engage deeply in issues of race, racism, and racial justice. The dimension, though, that I, I'd argue that we, as a field we haven't engaged with deeply is thinking about the complex learning process and processes uh, that are involved in understanding issues of race, racism, and racial justice. And, and part, of, uh, part of what I'd argue is by understanding these, uh, these learning processes, we can, we can hopefully move past some of the barriers and understand why some of the possible routes work in, in terms of leading us to what we see as a at least temporary destination. All right? And so how, how can we understand these processes that would support prospective teachers as they, as they become educators? Uh, so my, my approach to, to studying uh, teachers' growth as, uh, as, uh, as folks who are contending with issues of, of race, racism, and racial justice, tries to work at the tensions of the learning sciences and social theory and cultural studies. And part of the argument that I make is that in social theory and cultural studies, uh, they've provided powerful tools for us to understand the macro level processes that lead to issues of inequity and injustice but they, they don't allow us to understand how individuals change or don't change. On the contrary, uh, fields like the learning sciences have paid excruciating detail to, to growth 
um, in terms of developing anal the concepts or analyses, particularly in math and science, but have oftentimes shied away with, from, from things that are political. Um, so in terms of my own preparation tradition, it's been trying to leverage the analytical tools of the learning sciences to understand questions around ideology and ideological change. Um, so uh, the, the two uh, studies that I want to focus on here, just to give us some space to reflect on something concrete, is, is one, as uh, thinking about my work on ideological shifts as learning processes, and the second is thinking about the role of, of teacher, programs of teacher education, and particularly how programs of teacher education are mediators of racialized identities. Um, that said, there's a couple of other pieces that I think might be, might be relevant that I'm not gonna to touch on here, but I'd be more than happy to talk to any of you afterwards, is, um, is some of the work that I've done in my social foundations of education class, and thinking about how it is that we articulate purpose when the purpose of a social foundations class often seems so distant, to the immediate needs of students and how we create a context of purpose within those spaces. But then also the role of tools and artifacts and norms in, in shaping collective uh, racialized meanings within professional developments as well. Um, so thinking about ideological shifts as learning processes. So I draw again a lot from Stuart Hall and, and Antonio Gramsci in terms of cultural studies and, and, and social theory, but also the work of, um, of Andy Sessa looking at conceptual change in physics. And these look, they seem like very different worlds uh, and uh, spent a lot of time, again, I shared this earlier with someone, uh, a lot of time in Andy's, in Andy's lab thinking about if you throw a ball up in the air, what sort of forces are acting on it, how people make sense of these things. But then also in a lot of my coursework on ethnic studies and, and um, social, thinking about uh, ideology, but seeing an overlap and a particularly interesting overlap, um, at least for me, and that was like, uh, make, making this argument that people make sense of the world through what I call naturalized axioms. Um, and, and these are very commonsensical, taken for granted assumptions. So I call them axioms because, again, they're, they're taken for granted. Naturalized to emphasize that they're socially constructed and um, they, they take the role of common sense. There's nothing inherently commonsensical about them, but they become commonsensical within a particular historical moment. So examples of these might be, uh, if, you, if you try harder, you will succeed. And I've argued that, uh, and, and again, drawing from Sir Paul and, and Gramsci, that uh, ideology such as meritocracy doesn't operate from people learning meritocracy, but it's the way in which I, meritocracy is articulated in such a way uh, that people, people come to interpret many parts of the world through this lens that if you try harder, you will succeed. People don't uniformly think about the world like that, but there is a way in which uh, a larger ideology operates just through these very commonsensical notions. Other, uh, other examples might be kids are just smart or inequality will always exist. But what's important to recognize here is that these aren't the only ways in which we make sense. We move through them uh, in our daily lives. We can walk into a different space and reason about this differently. So for example, uh, we might also argue that people do well if they are supported. Intelligence is malleable. Greed causes inequality. So we see ourselves as individuals moving through these different ways of sense making, but ideological contestation also happens at this level. And we saw this, say, with the, with the Occupy movement. And with the Occupy movement, part of what they were trying to uh, move us to is move away from the sense that inequality will always exist to understand that greed can cause inequality. So these ideological contestations are very, they appeal to our common sense. And that's how ideologies reproduce themselves, but that's also how ideologies are, are transformed or contested. So a few qualities of these are, again, it's, it's very context dependent. They're fragmentary, not uniform. So we can, we can use different forms of common sensical thinking in different spaces within, within, a, uh, within a few minutes, within a different space that we move into. Um, it's really hard to articulate the rationale for using one over the other. We, we just kind of know that this is a sense, this is a place where we think uh, if he just worked harder, he would have succeeded. We, just, we don't know exactly why, but that's why we, we just invoke that explanation. Um, it can shift in the moment, and it's hard to notice, uh, notice contradictions. So this brings me to another phenomenon. I want us to dig into this a bit. But this is a phenomenon which I refer to as, uh, as shifting salience. 
And that's where an interpretation or explanation of a context shifts from one ideological meaning to another. Um, so I want to give one illustrative example of this so we can kind of start digging into it. So this is uh, taken from an interview that I did with a fourth year teacher <coughs> in a master's in administrative credential program. Um, during the course of the interview, she had highlighted the problem of labeling students. Uh, and she refers to a child as a problem child. And, uh, but then she quickly added that other teachers and administrators referred to him as a problem child. Uh, so at some point, I, I asked her, is it, is it problematic that administrators and teachers refer to him as a problem child? So um, her, her response is uh, it's just three sentences, or, or, but I want us to spend a little bit, bit of time digging into it. So she responds saying, oh, that's definitely a problem because that gets those children to think that is all they expect from me. Nothing is ever gonna happen. I might get in trouble. But really, what's the outcome of that? Suspension, a couple of days at home, that's no big deal. So here what she's, she's saying is that labeling a child is problematic because then she, uh, this, this child is under the impression that the, the administrators and teachers just don't care about the child. Right? And, uh, and, and these things such as suspension don't carry any real consequence. But then she adds without any interruption, they already do that anyways. The parents, if it's not convenient for babysitting, They'll keep them at home, or picking them up is not convenient, so they keep them at home. And I want us to think about these two different days there, right? That the first day is referring to administrators, and the second day is referring to parents. Now, in general, the way we interpret this, a, a lot of the work would say, well, this, this top, it, it would try to interpret this as if this was the real feeling of the teacher, and the, the top part, it's a cover story, right? It's uh, as the, the teacher was just trying to say the right thing. And this is the most common explanation we see of this sort of phenomenon in, in teacher education, uh, teacher education research. But what I argue again is that this teacher doesn't hold one belief, right? She's, she's holding multiple ways of sense making. And she's holding these, both of these ways of sense making at the same time. So there's, there's something to build on in terms of her systemic critique of administrators and, and, and teachers, but there is a way in which there's a tendency for us to then, as we, as we talk through things, to oftentimes settle in on a deficit framing of, of students and parents. So how do we understand holding multiple perspectives at the same time, and what that means for the process of learning and unlearning ideologies? Now that, that was an example of an instance, but I do want to spend a little bit of time also thinking about what an extended period of change might look like. Uh, so this was from uh, a study that I did with a group of uh, first and five first and second year teachers, and they investigated how to incorporate issues of social justice in their math and science classrooms. Uh, so the focus, uh, my focus here was on one second year math teacher. And and, and during this process, they were trying to investigate an issue that was relevant to their teaching. And um, they would present their idea and they'd bring it back to the larger group. And they would try to they would receive advice and help from their colleagues. So this is, a, between the first meeting we had in October and uh, in February where this, um, this teacher, who I'll refer to him as Alan, um, presented his first idea, there's a number of ways in which Alan was making sense of the world that became evident. So the first was um, a firm commitment to that, that school tracking was inequitable. And especially in math, it's inequitable. This was uh, a few years after the Iraq War, and Alan was thinking about ways in which he can incorporate curriculum in his math classroom to think about the, the differential impact of war on youth of color. So again, thinking about the spend, uh, defense spending versus educational spending, thinking about um, the, uh, the enlistment of, of young men of color uh, on, on the front lines and the disproportional effects. So he has a lot of large commitments that he's really struggling to, uh, to uh, actualize in his classroom. But when it, when it came uh, time for him to, to put his question forward and to pursue a question, the question he ended up settling on is why do students fail at being students? And 
from my perspective, this was somewhat astonishing to see someone who had thought about such complex issues and was really committed to issues of equity, social justice, and really thinking about the global connections of war and, and race and racism to settle on this question. So again, common explanations, and we hear this more, more and more often, is, well, theory just doesn't matter, and it doesn't influence teachers' practice. The second is that teachers' real beliefs, and again, going back to the last example, are different than his or her professed beliefs. But what I'd like to argue is that a teacher's process of coming to see concepts of social justice in his or her own practice is gradual, intermittent, and sometimes regressive. It moves back and forth. Um, I also want to recognize again that um, being a te having been a teacher, knowing the realities of a classroom and stepping into the classroom, is that this was also formulated within the realities of his second year of teaching. So he's feeling overwhelmed. He's trying to connect to his students. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that um, as we move forward, that it doesn't, it doesn't become um, an easy way of explaining what people should or should not do, but for us to really, really understand their lived experiences and their lived realities. So what Alan does is before he comes into the, um, the meeting, he said that he decided he was going to give a, a survey to his students and to see how they spent their time after school. And he was, um, so he was interested in how the successful students spent their time after school and how the unsuccessful students spent their time after school. Uh, and uh, so he had collected this data and he brought it. And at some point, one of the other uh, teachers in, in the room asked, so what did you find? What was the difference between the successful and unsuccessful students? And, and, and within, within this framing, I think it's really important for us to understand, again, what are some of the commonsensical ways in which Alan's thinking about this? One, he's, he is coming to this idea that there are some students who are just successful and some students who are not. He's, ex he's accepted this binary, right? And, and also, he's come to the conclusion that some students just don't use their time wisely. So it's important for us to understand what are the commonsensical ideas that's driving, um, driving um, Alan's sense-making here. But what was most astonishing, though, is when his colleague put forth this question, like, what difference did you find? Alan says, actually, I didn't find much difference. The successful and the unsuccessful students spent time pretty much the same. But then it gets more complicated, because in most cases, then we would just either put away that data, or we would say, well, we need to ask a different question. Maybe, maybe there's a way in which they're spending the same amount of time, but some people have access to certain types of capital that they might be using the time differently. But rather than that, Alan decides that, well, he's concerned whether the unsuccessful students are spending their time on leisure activities or helping their parent with legitimate, parents with legitimate obligations. And again, it's irrelevant to the, the logic of the inquiry. But what we see again is the very commonsensical dominant notions of, of what young people of color do and what's justified and what's not from his perspective as, uh, as an upper middle class white male teacher. Right? So he's starting to craft a new inquiry even though the data at hand would tell him that he needs to stop that inquiry. Um, so at this point, after, uh, after this, I follow up with an email and I, I urge Alan to that we should really examine our own practice as teachers. We should assume the best on, our part, on the part of students and parents, and I draw a lot of Paul Littman's work. And um, we should focus on classroom and school practices over which we have control. And Alan responds saying, yes, I'll be careful not to blame students. So, so I, I, I do, at, at this point, I'm, I'm assuming we're sort of on the, we're starting to get on the same page. Um, but it was also starting to help me understand how this concept can take on very different meanings, right? So the idea that teachers shouldn't blame their students or shouldn't hold deficit views can mean very different things. So one would, might be a, a sense of ignoring deficits, right? Like really, at a very fundamental level, um, students and their families don't have uh, the right set of values or choices, but I'm going to ignore them. Or it could mean, well, they, uh, they're, they're making choices that aren't the best choices, but that we have to understand that, that within 
their, their social context and it's not their fault. Or the, the position that I was working more from was that the very act of blaming students is one way in which uh, dominant narratives reproduce themselves, right? We are actors and we reproduce, uh, we reproduce these inequities and injustices. So they're very different meanings and oftentimes in teacher education programs when we try to develop shared languages, we don't dig deep enough in terms of thinking about what are the multiple meanings. Uh, so we might be saying the same things, but are we meaning the same things? Uh, so Al Alan comes back in March and he, he presents, uh, presents his uh, inquiry yet one more time, but at this point he's, he's come to the conclusion that students it's really about students not coming prepared. So they're not coming prepared either because they're not motivated, they don't plan ahead, or they don't have the right home environment. So Alan decides that it's about planning ahead and he really wants to get them to think about planning ahead. Uh, but what, what, what I argue is an interesting change at this point, or a really important change at this point, is he starts to see that change needs to come from student self-reflection and there's something that he can do as a teacher in, in his own practice to support that process of reflection. And there I'd argue is that this new emerging concept of teachers, uh, how, how he comes to understand teachers blaming students and starting to understand both the agency of students but also the potential of teachers to support that agency. Uh, but as, as he had settled on that, I, uh, this was one of the few instances again where um, I took a proactive stance and interrupted that conversation. Uh, but it, it prompted the group to consider the political nature of questions, how we might reframe Alan's work as why, uh, instead of asking why do students fail at being students, how can we reframe it as why do schools fail students at being students? And, and really thinking about rather than focusing on kids not being motivated, how we can understand the ways in which schools potentially alienate students. Um, and at this point, again, Alan, Alan says that he'll drop the idea of successful and unsuccessful students. And he goes back, to, he'll go back to the big picture to see what teachers can do. And, and this, I'd argue, is a, is a, is a really critical transformation in, in Alan, where he starts to, start to see that the framing of his question was problematic in the first place. Um, and, and evidence of that starts to come up in the, in the following meeting when I um, made a short presentation on, on the making of the urban, and we discussed George Lipset's work uh, around possessive investment of whiteness, and Alan was the first person to respond. And Alan says, I feel a lot of times when we talk about schooling, what our role as teachers is, it's very hard for us to hold that big, these big pictures in mind as well. What does it mean to be teaching in a system where, where it is not accidental that poverty exists. It's not accidental that there is a huge disparity of wealth. I think it's very easy for us to fall back on. It's a family, for example, or it's a lack of opportunities. But to what extent are those lack of opportunities built very much within the larger system? And, and, and again, thinking about how growth, growth happens, it's not only within the teacher education program, but this was a, um, the week before Alan had visited his uh, his cousins in a, in a school in a town, I'll call it Newberry, but it's the, it's the town in, in California that has the largest uh, median income. And he visited the school and, the, the, and he described the school as being like a liberal arts college next to a country club. And really seeing the disparities, the real disparities that exist between its context there and the, in, in the East Bay. Uh, and, and, and we see more of this in, uh, in a June interview and, and again, I think uh, what's most important here is, is his emphasis on practice, where one, he recognizes that students are really different in different periods of the day, but he talks about the grading system and he says, what will people think about the grading system in 30 years? Uh, will they look at it and recognize that it's unfair and that it's kept a whole group of people out of being college eligible? And he, again, the, the movement between the large, the top level language with the practice is also saying how schools perpetuate the whole thing about stratified labor force, but then asks, how might I do things to counteract that? And how can I tweak things? How can I do things myself to change that? And he starts looking at his practice 
much, much more closely to think about how it reproduces an inequitable system and then how it might challenge it. So it's gone from a large abstract goal to something that's immediate to its practice. Um, Well, so is, but I think the big takeaway from this is that he starts to see that his initial formulation of this question, why do students fail at being students, is an instance, is an example of teachers blaming students. But I want us to step back and think that to learn, to understand that dimension of it was a huge investment of time and energy and commitment from someone who already had such strong notions of, of, or commitments to issues around equity and justice. Um, so how can we think about teachers and teacher ed? Uh, it's, so the, the two takeaways, takeaways that are here are how teachers and teacher educators learn to see a concept such as teachers blaming students in their own practice, even when they have strong commitments to racial justice and equity, can be gradual, intermittent, and sometimes regressive. But it, it makes us step back and think, what opportunities do we provide in teacher education for a deep, sustained, committed, and critical examin examination of prospective teachers' pattern and ways of sense making, such as deficit instructions of racialized students? So this is, again, a moment that I just want us to step back and think about our programs and, and the work that we do. So, so the, the question here is, influ if influencing conceptions about equity and justice is a long and difficult process, how can a teacher education program support teachers' growth as social agents? But I'd also like us to think about how can teacher educators be prepared to do such work? Um, because those, those forms of facilitation also become really profound. So again, if we can just take two minutes uh, to, to just talk to someone next to you, it can be a new person. But uh, again, like, what, are, what are you thinking about these two? Two questions. Of, of change in teacher education that dominates is one a very cognitive model, and that's 
uh, that oftentimes teachers commit, uh, both, both white teachers and teachers of color, given the context that, in which we live, come largely shaped through uh, ideologies of whiteness. And as a, as a cognitive model, then, our, our goal as a teacher education program is to move them over towards uh, these, these conceptions or beliefs or attitudes around, around racial justice. Uh, then we have a, a socialization model where we, we understand that people have been, teachers in particular, have been uh, socialized by families and friends, by schools, neighborhoods, uh, their affiliations and churches, uh, society and media in general. And uh, as, as teacher education programs, we have some commitment then to, to re-socialize teachers uh, towards uh, issues of equity and social justice. But both of these are pretty problematic because they tend to see teacher education as a, as a very insular box, right? And uh, rather than saying that these, these connections are far more complex, right? And, and the, it, it becomes much more intricate seeing how, how things are, are, are embedded, networked, and, um, and meshed. So how then do we start to understand teacher education in, um, in the ways in which it mediates these forms of racial identity rather than thinking about simplified cognitive or, or social uh, uh, mo models of, of socializing teachers differently. Uh, so, so the study that it, that it did was based on in-depth interviews with 14 pre-service teachers. And, and I focused here primarily on four white pre-service teachers. And what I was trying to do here was to prioritize a critical analysis of whiteness and a learning perspective at the same time. And, and to, again, understand an exploratory framework of programs of teacher education as mediators of racial identity. Uh, so what I want to do uh, at, at this point is just to think about uh, one, a short excerpt from, from one of the teacher candidates that I'll refer to as Lisa. I felt like I couldn't talk in that classroom because I felt there were a lot of people expressing their interest on their experience being a Latina or a person of color. And I felt like my opinion wasn't valued because I was white, then supposedly privileged, and I don't know what it's like to go through something hard. And so a lot of the times I feel like I was frustrated because I was, I felt like I was the white girl of privilege. When it's, I guess I felt judged before I got to know these people, it would have been nice to get to know some of them as why the cohorts were, because we could talk about those issues because we each know each other's story, each other's background. So it's very different than a classroom where you don't know mm -hmm. the majority of the people there. So this was Lisa talking about her, her experience in social foundations in particular, but the teacher education program more, more generally. And what I want us to think about is, is the multiple ways in which we try to analyze this in the field. And one is, is prioritizing an analysis of whiteness. Now what we see here, it, through an analysis of whiteness, this would be a, a, an example where a young person such as Lisa is disrupting the possibility of productive conversations around race. And, uh, that there is a, there is a larger ideological uh, context in which white victimhood is oftentimes appealed to. Right? Uh, things of white uh, reverse racism is oftentimes invoked to put a stop to any productive conversation around race. And, and from that analysis, what Lisa is engaging here is, is a typical example of that, where once you start to push difficult conversations around race, there's an appeal to white victim, victimhood. And, uh, and it's a powerful ideological construction in, in this post-racial and supposedly colorblind society that prevents a deep interrogation of race and a deep interrogation of the historical context of race in this country. So it's important for us to recognize this analysis. In addition, though, as teacher educators, we need to, want, we need to ask ourselves, what is our responsibility then to a candidate such as Lisa in terms of move, uh, moving her or helping her understand the complexities of race and racism in this country? Is that macro-level analysis sufficient? Now, um, I'd argue that 
the response that has come up is oftentimes the teacher's learner perspective that, uh, again, uh, with the theories of whiteness, Lucy, Zeus Leonardo's work is tremendously helpful in understanding this. Uh, but the teacher's learner perspective oftentimes put forward by a scholar such as Karen Lowenstein uh, tries to acknowledge that everyone is a complex being with their own learning needs and helps us understand the spaces in which uh, people like Lisa need to learn. However, there is again a risk of prioritizing an analysis of learning that erases a deep interrogation of power and privilege. And uh, so we, we, we see these opposing perspectives that offer helpful insights, but definitely have their own shortcomings. So it's important for us to think about ways in which this idea that I felt like my opinion wasn't valued is a real subjective experience. It is her real experience. Um, and that I don't know what it's like to go through something hard, again, indicates certain, certain dimensions of the interactions or norms that are created with a, within a program of teacher education. But again, uh, she does this in a way that appeals to a larger ideological space of colorblindness and, uh, and, and being in a supposed post-racial society that undermines any real analysis of race. Uh, so, so it's important for us to start to understand the ways in which these operate together. And part of what I propose here is, is for us to think about this intersection between ideology and program structure and culture. And just to be clear with, with the language I'm using here, the program structure is thinking about the relatively stable arrangements of a program, and that can be admissions requirements, course offerings, cohorts, uh, field placements, faculty hiring, that largely determine membership and shape interactions between members. The program culture is the, are the norms, the values, the rituals, uh, ceremonies, symbols, and stories that make up the persona of the program. So again, these are the unwritten expectations that build up over time as members work together, solve problems, and deal with challenges. Uh, so, so this overall context shapes the notions of mutual learning among peers, investment in the success of fellow teachers, and competitions over marker, markers such as good teachers. And uh, the program of, of teacher education that I studied, part of what became the marker of the competition is who is social, socially just and who is not socially just. Right? So a program that's focused on social justice ends up uh, becoming a space where, where that becomes uh, the marker over which a lot of candidates and faculty in some way compete over. And so it's important for us to recognize that the inadvertent uh, issues that arise as we frame our programs, right? that uh, a, a program focused on social justice can end up leading to these forms of, of competition that end up becoming problematic and take away from mutual investment and support, uh, uh, support of each other. But what I would argue again is like, uh, when we think about the larger ideological context, there are many ways to be white in, the, in, our, in our society. Uh, one can be a white national, um, a nationalist. One can be an anti-racist white. One can be um, a liberal white. One can be a person who believes that we are past race and race doesn't matter. Um, there are many race, ways of being white that are somewhat available within the larger ideological context. However, programs of teacher education tend to um, whether explicitly or implicitly, do select for certain types. It's very rare that we will see in the white nationalist in our teacher education program meditations of equity and racial justice. There are ways in which certain identities are, are just excluded. Um, so I, I argue there are certain ways and avail there are certain available racial identities within programs of teacher education. But what we're also seeing though is we interact, and it's within our interactions that are argue a lot of our identities become instantiated. So again, going back to the example of Lisa, when she says, I can't speak because I'm white, it draws, again, from a larger um, ideological and structural context that appeals to this notion of reverse racism or white victimhood. And it's a, it's, a, it's a construct that's available in the media, in the ways in which we make sense of the world. 
But it's also important for us as programs to teach education not to stop there, but then to ask ourselves, what is it about our program structure and culture that then shapes interactions that leads Lisa to make sense of the world in that manner? Right? Uh, so it's, it's an available ideological discourse, but what is it about interactions? How is it that people learn to talk to each other, to listen to each other, to dialogue with each other, to push each other in programs of teacher education that also shapes that way of making sense of the world or, or making sense of her experience within the program. So it's from those interactions that, again, and I draw a lot on, on Sparta Kusak's work here and extend their, uh, their notion of identity to un that we can start to understand identities or racialized identities through the sense of how do I see myself, how I see others, and how, how I feel others see me. And that's partially what I argue is happening with Lisa. It's through these three lenses that she started to understand her own identity as a white woman in this program of teacher education. And that's where there's this particular instantiated racialized identity for Lisa. Uh, and, and this wasn't the only way in which things played out. Uh, just very briefly, I'm not going to go into this other example in much depth, but there was an example of a, um, of a young man in Curtis who again came in with a, a lot of commitments to, to, to racial justice, social justice, and he was recognized uh, very early on as a white ally of the faculty and uh, the critical students in, in the program. But he forged a close relationship with Saul, and Saul, um, young man of color, but oftentimes interpreted the world through uh, a pull yourself up by the bootstraps uh, perspective. And, uh, and, and as, uh, as Chris started to forge this, um, uh, relation, uh, this friendship with, with Saul, he started to, uh, to see a few different things. One, he became acutely aware of frustration, alienation, and disengagement that Saul experienced. But he also, um, as, he, as he later explained, moved from forms of judgment to co-learning. And for him, then, to become a white ally meant to move to the space of, of co-learning. Uh, and, and also seen it with, uh, with uh, in, in some of my work, thinking about teachers of color, where college activists of color who have tremendous amount of experience as college activists, where the institution is clearly the other, and you can make clear demands on the institution and, uh, and, and forge, uh, forge your path forward in, in very public ways, needing to pause and think about what does this mean for me as a teacher, right? That these forms of activism have to be reshaped and recalibrated within the context of the classroom. Um, or thinking about ways in which even the discourse of being critical um, can inadvertently narrow and marginalize other dimensions, forms, and practices of criticality, particularly among educators of color. So again, this notion of sometimes we, the, the competition over the construct of critical, then exclude some people uh, from, uh, from this conversation. And what does it mean for us to then problematize these, uh, these, these terms and how the norms and interactions that allow students in our programs to engage with them, uh, with these constructs. So the big takeaway for, uh, for I conclude, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably skip over the opportunity for us to stop and talk one more time. But the big takeaway for me is the need for the need to insert our own agency and choices as teacher educators in the analysis of prospective teachers' ideological shifts by highlighting our role as individuals who co-construct the programmatic structure and culture that partially instantiates these teachers' racialized identities. And, and, and again, I, why I argue this again is that we we have oftentimes talked about why and why not teacher, prospective teachers move, or how they move, how they don't move. But we do so in such a way that advocates our own responsibility as teacher educators in creating the contexts in which they learn or don't learn. And I think it's important for us to reinsert our agency and to understand our role in shaping these identities. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over the, the chance that around this, but, but the question in the back of our minds is, 
what are some ways in which the structure and culture of your teacher education program can be reshaped to support teachers' identities as social agents who are committed to racial justice and equity? And how can teacher educators be prepared to more closely examine and affect a teacher education program's teacher education program structure and culture toward this goal? Um, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip over this and bring us to the end. Where it comes back to this question, what is our way ahead? Given the larger context of neoliberalism and market, market oriented reform, how do we advance teacher education's engagement with issues of race, racism, and racial justice? Um, and, and again, I think it's important for us to go back to this, uh, this, uh, this idea that if schools and teacher education programs are sites where we learn to con construct, consent to, navigate, contest, and re-envision our racialized society, what is our responsibilities as teachers and teacher educators? And, and while there's a great push to think about how we must survive, stay relevant, or try to do the best, how can we balance that in some form with a true appreciation and recognition and, and support for teachers and social agents in the stratified democracy, even if this isn't the most popular thing to do at this historical moment? Again, it wasn't the most popular thing for, uh, for, for those who pioneered social, social foundations movement to do in, the, in, in light of the Great Depression. But what is our responsibility uh, decades later when we're in a very similar uh, historical, political, and economic context? I think it's also important for us as teacher educators in particular to acknowledge that we've talked a lot about the why. We know why we need to prepare teachers to do, do this work. We, need, we know why teachers need to embrace the sense of responsibility in their work. We oftentimes know what we need to do. Um, scholars like uh, Rich Miller have, have talked about a deep analysis of meritocracy, uh, colorblindness. But what we haven't spent a lot of time is thinking deeply about this question of how to. And I'd argue part of it is just our emphasis on the notion of teaching that we assume that we know what we need to teach. And in some ways, it's this, it's this process of imparting. But how do we change that language of teaching for racial justice to learning for racial justice and highlighting that process of learning in powerful ways that then can transform our programs, uh, the teachers that choose to work with us, and the work that we can eventually do together. Um, in terms of interrogating and addressing our own power in ourselves and our respective teachers, I want to close with a quote from, from Bell Hooks, uh, where Bell Hooks reminds us, for me, forgiveness and compassion are always linked. How do we hold people accountable for our wrongdoing? And yet, at the same time, remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed. And for us to do this work, I'd argue, we have to really work at this intersection of structure and ideology, but also learning. If we are to, if we are to acknowledge the historical context that have brought us here, if we, if, we, if we are to engage with the deep injustices and inequities that we've inherited and we continue to reproduce, but we are committed to transforming them, and we're committed to growing as, as a collective, we need these analyses to come together. And, and again, my work here, as I as I conclude, is just a reminder that it's an invitation for us who do this work at multiple levels, whether we're doing it at a policy level, whether we're doing it at a programmatic level, whether we're doing it at a pedagogical level, whether we're teachers that are engaged in this work, whether we are our community allies and advocates that are engaged in this work, we need to work together. And so this was an a place of giving answers, but it was an invitation for us to form that space uh, to reshape the, the political context in which teaching, 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 teacher education is now finding itself. So thank you. The equivalent response that I oftentimes uh, give teachers if they're asking about the heterogeneity in their own classrooms, right? we, we expect our teachers to uh, to teach to very diverse um, classrooms with, with different sets of skills, 
experiences, backgrounds, content knowledges. And I think it's important for us then as, as teacher educators to have, have that same commitment in the work that we do. Um, and, and I think that commitment at, at our, I'd say becomes very place-based to the, the challenges that you face here uh, in New York are probably very different than, um, than what, what I uh, oftentimes encounter in Los Angeles. But I think once we start to think about race as a system of power, and this conversation came up earlier, is that oftentimes we think about notions of race as a, as a static construct, right? That we, uh, we look around and we think we understand uh, people's racial, uh, racially, uh, how, what they are, right, in terms of race. But what gets erased in that is the processes of racialization. And I think if we are able to talk about the processes of racialization, uh, we, we're all impacted by that in multiple ways. Um, so whether it's someone who is an immigrant who has, who's come here uh, from, uh, from, a different, from a different societal context, they're coming into a racialized society. And it's important for us then to deeply interrogate uh, the racialized structure into which we are we're entering, and and I think it, it can open up a powerful conversation of uh, of how we understand race and racialization, or even this question of how did one perceive issues of race before before entering entering this country, and how are they seeing it play out now? And I think there's rich potential there, and for us to understand the power of narrative. Right? The stories we've told about ourselves, the, the stories that others have told about us. Uh, so if we're coming from a uh, upper class, homogenous uh, neighborhood, it becomes, a, a, and I think we saw that partially in Alan's case too, right? That Alan's ability to understand the experiences of Newberry and then contrast it with what, uh, what he sees as a teacher was a powerful learning experience for him. Uh, so I, I do think if we go back to really thinking about processes of power and starting to engage in this analysis, like what processes of power are playing out here, uh, it gives us far more leverage to understand these issues and to engage in deep dialogue and to learn from, uh, from teachers and, and, and our, our students. And I meant, uh, again, in one of the earlier conversations I um, mentioned, that when we look at, say, classroom videos, oftentimes our first response is to ask this question, how do we see race playing out here? Right? Or how is a teacher differentially treating students based on race? Uh, if, if we want to move towards a, a, a racial dialogue, and this is productive, it allows us to see sort of differentials. But again, there's a, a risk here that it re, re-inscribes this very static construct of race. So if we could ask that question coupled with this uh, following the question, how do we see students being racialized in this context? Or how do we see processes of racialization playing out here? I think then it helps us all engage in the space of uh, how do we understand race as a, as, a, uh, as a system of power and how we see that operate. Uh, so I think, it, I think partially it's the ways in which we, we shift the conversation um, but partially ways in which we uh, understand ways in which we all are implicated within a racialized system. And we have time for one more. Hello, Dr. Philip. My name is Philip. <laughs> um, so I know you talked about uh, racial ideology and power structures. I wonder if you can hit on the ideology of ability, specifically because we have a disproportionate number of students of color being placed in the special education track. We have that idea that they are those other students, so I'm, I'm a teacher right now. Uh, I've been a teacher in and out of classrooms starting from fifth grade 
uh, for about nine years now. And I started with a student that was on an RTI, uh, an ESL student. So, like, you know, I, through my whole experiences, those interactions that I was placed in, I was able to develop this long, uh, more in-depth and oftentimes regressive uh, understanding. But it, it wasn't until there was a, like a deep interrogation on what I, what I thought of ability was or capability was that I really started to interrogate, interrogate racial ideology more. So how do you think that ideology of ability, of ability really plays into when we have dis different tracks for teachers? Those teachers that are going to be teaching general education students that maybe get one quote unquote multicultural course that embeds uh, a disability or special education lens. And then those quote unquote other track of teachers that are going to be teaching the special ed teacher, uh, special ed students. You know, because if we still have that bifurcation, then, you know, where, where are we really going to go? So, yeah, thank you for that question. It was actually touches so much on a conversation I had earlier this morning um, with, with uh, some colleagues here in terms of thinking about the, the spaces of inter intersection. And I, I do think oftentimes we think about forms of power and oppression and marginalization as being very discrete and separate. Um, but the question that you're asking, right, how do we start to see these intersections, is, is one of the most powerful questions for us to disrupt these forms of oppression. And, and especially with ability that it plays out at, at so many different levels. If we go back to even the sense of, of meritocracy, it's very much uh, imbued with assumptions about ability and how ability is constructed. Uh, and and when, we, when we think about the historical construction of race, right, particularly its roots within the eugenics movement, right, we, we again see ways in which uh, constructions of ability and, and race have been so coupled together. And, and, in, and in perhaps frightening ways, we also see a reemergence of that language, particularly with uh, some of the new work in, in the neurosciences that it tries to reinscribe uh, ideological constructions around ability and race that we've, we've worked very hard uh, over decades to push against. And uh, the reinscription of that within scientific language is, is really disturbing uh, from my perspective. Um, and, and, and for us to do this work, and I think it's essential for us to, to, to really get at that notion of ability and to, and to disrupt it in ways uh, that challenge some of the fundamentals around schooling. Right? Even schooling is very much based on very static and uh, notions of ability uh, that is still embedded in this idea of sorting people based on ability that doesn't recognize uh, the dynamic nature of, uh, of ability. And um, I think that disruption is essential for us to rethink the purpose of schooling, but also um, the possibilities of schooling. Um, and, and I think what's what's important for us to recognize is that sometimes when we think about these uh, these these constructs, they can they can feel overwhelming. They can feel as though there is no way out. Uh, but I, I think it's also important for us to step back and. Like David Harvey writes about this in, uh, in his brief history of neoliberalism, but neoliberalism in, in the late 70s was a minority position, right? And, but it was through an ideological contestation that it really took root. Uh, so what does it mean for us then to think about these as ideological contestations that we are continually engaged in? And we all have different roles in it. And, and I think even as, as teachers, and, uh, how we communicate notions of ability implicitly or explicitly to our students is one way in which we're either reproducing or transforming the larger system that we're, we have, uh, we're a part of. And the, the immense responsibility that teachers have in, in communicating different notions of ability within a system that, so, that makes it so difficult for us to even imagine 
a different um, a different possibility.